Welcome to the Soundtrap Education Summit, a free online event dedicated to empowering and amplifying student voice with the theme, Their Voice, Their World. We're bringing you inspiring and practical messages from musicians, educators, podcasters, students, and more that can help you make change in your classroom right away. I'm Matt Miller, author of Ditch That Textbook and the moderator of the summit. Our sponsor and host of the summit is Soundtrap, a collaborative and creative audio editing platform. Soundtrap for Education empowers students and teachers to explore creative sound recording in all subjects, for all ages, and all ability levels. And you can sign up for their free online course to learn how to bring music and podcasting to your classroom at academy.soundtrap.com. And in today's session, this is gonna be different. This is this is gonna be something unlike anything that we've had in the summit. And I'm super excited for you to check it out because we have my man over here, Duran Hall, who has A, inspiration to bring and B, friends to bring it with, okay? So um, we're gonna be talking all about this topic that is very near and dear to his heart, which is music for liberation. And this plays very much into his story. So um, Duran, real quick, real briefly, before we bring on all of our guests, um, do you wanna tell everybody a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then maybe a little bit about why this topic is so important to you? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, by the way. And number one, for everybody who's like listening, the hope is that this is going to be fun. Okay. So like, I want us to just have a little bit of fun as we're having this conversation. It doesn't have to be so heavy. Um, uh, so I'm Deron Hall. I'm originally from Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, it's, a, it's a small coastal beach community. Um, I was a French hornist. Um, I was an arts administrator. Um, I've been a, a funder. Um, I've worked at small organizations, grassroots organizations, large scale organizations, um, uh, such as the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Carnegie Hall and others. Um, and in my own journey, um, I'm someone who uh, had a really great music educator in middle school who told me that I can do anything that I wanted to do. And I believed her and truth be told, she was right. So I'm here. Uh, partly because of uh, the things that she told me. Um, and I have uh, uh, had the great pleasure of running into lots of different people who also use the arts or music or had experiences that told them the same thing. And my hope is that not only will you be able to connect with them as like human beings and you'll meet them as well, um, not only will you be able to see yourselves in them, but the young people who you serve, who you work for, who you connect with, who you're responsible for, that you also see them in us. Um, so yeah, that, that that's kind of uh, where I am right now. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. And so um, without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and start bringing some of those folks into the conversation. So check out all of these faces here. So um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to drop off here and I'm going to hand the mic to Duran and he's going to lead this conversation. So um, I know you're going to love this. I know you're going to get some really good ideas. So Duran, go ahead and take it. Okay. So all right. Uh, all right. So for the panelists, you don't have to be muted. You can take yourself off of mute whenever you need to. Feel free to jump in anytime. Uh, for the audience, this is a conversation. This is an actual conversation. And I hope it is received that way. And sometimes people might agree. Sometimes people might not agree. Our experiences are not all the same. And we come from all different parts of the world. And that's important to know. In this space that we have created here, it's just people being people. Okay, that's what it really is. Um, and it just so happens that said people are phenomenal and I would like them to introduce themselves. Uh, 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 just, just like a, a short intro that says like, who are you? But like, don't be modest, please. Okay, uh, don't be modest. Uh, uh, follow, please give us, you know, who you actually are. <laughs> oh, you picked me the first. Okay, there you go. Um, everybody hear me, right? Okay. So my name is Falu, uh, and I'm an Indian classical singer-songwriter. Um, I live in New York. I have been Grammy nominated. Uh, I work with Duran very closely at Carnegie Hall. I am a teaching artist, and I have used Soundtrap for all my workshops since COVID hit, 
and it is the most amazing platform that I have got my hands to and everything I learn about it it's kind of a little kid jumping out of the seat and saying yes I did it and it's been a really positive experience having music as a tool of survival of happiness upliftment hope and love in such stressful times so being an ambassador of Indian music at Carnegie Hall I feel it's our utmost responsibility to spread and share this love of music with young people all around the world that will then take on this tradition and pass it on to the next generation where music becomes our religion and we all speak the language of love and liberation together and make a beautiful world together. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Falu will go a little bit further into uh, her story uh, a little bit later. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll have a, a few more conversations too. And it's also interesting or important to note that, you know, we are not here because of soundtrack, right? Is we're not here because of soundtrack. We're here because we have a perspective. It just so happens that we've used soundtrack, and, and many many of us have used soundtrack. But that's not necessarily why we're here. That's important important to note. Uh, how about um, uh, Ezekiel? Uh, tell us who you really. Who are you really? Yes, who am I really? I'm a fan. Uh, if, if I'm going to the root of why I work in music, I'm a fan of music. I'm a fan of sounds, of expression, artistic expression at that. But um, I'm a Rockingham, North Carolina born, um, ended up moving to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I went to you know, middle school and high school, and then I'm currently in Atlanta Transplant. I'm a co-founder of a label, distribution company, management company named Since the 80s. Um, and we represent such acts as JID, Earth Gang, Neomza, uh, a broad range of songwriters. And honestly, I'm just one of those people who really believe um, and the power of, of the industry of music and the power of creating a pipeline between community and music. Um, that's just a little bit about me. Thank you, Conley. Thank you, Conley. And again, there's so much to unpack there, but we'll get back to that. Uh, come on, Chris, tell us, who, tell us who you are, really. The, the, the big version, but also the short version, because you know you can talk. <laughs> Chris Franceschi, um, recording artist, Memphis, Tennessee, songwriter, producer, um, founder of uh, Youth Behind the Music, uh, which is a program that creates pathways to jobs in the arts. And I've had an opportunity to use music as a vessel to connect to the people, but also share different perspectives um, and think outside of the box. Thanks, Chris. Chris is extremely modest just now, and, and we'll unpack some things. <laughs> um, but a very talented lyricist um, who has something to say, um, but also who has a deep internal world that is, is it needs to be expressed in the world, but that's a whole other thing. Tanya, who yeah. are you really? Let's talk, talk to us. Who are you really? Um, well, my name is Tanya Dyson, I'm Memphis, Tennessee. I am um, a singer songwriter, a lover of music first and foremost, and that really informs everything else that I do. I'm the executive um, director of Memphis Slam Collaboratory, um, a home based on the, the blues musician Memphis Slam, where our mission is to push um, artist careers further using his life as um, the mission. I'm also the founder of Neo Soulville, a um, niche marketing um, company here in Memphis. Um, also the founder and owner of Kickspin, the only black female owned uh, record store in the city. Um, I'm also the founder of the Soulsville USA Festival, which is a, a festival in celebration of the amazing Soulsville neighborhood. Um, and again, just a lover of music, educator, mentor, um, and overall peaceful person. Come on, peace. Bring that peace through. And a badass singer who, who has literally swept me off my feet with words before in many different instances uh, when I when I lived in Memphis. So I want to I want to elevate the fact that you have traveled the world singing um, uh, from everywhere from Oslo to you know everywhere else. So that that's important to to say. She's the badass. Uh, and and last but certainly uh, not least, uh, Joshua. Hey, what's up, bro? I love that, bringing in the spirit of peace. Uh, my name is Joshua Bennett. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of English and creative writing at Dartmouth. I'm from Yonkers, New York. Uh, who am I really? I'm my mother's son. 
Uh, and she grew up in Viola at Carnegie Hall in the South Bronx. So the, the spirit of her persistence and tenacity, um, the fact that I was only allowed to listen to Motown and gospel growing up, no secular music in the house, so I had to sneak in hip hop uh, via mixtapes I got from my boy Vincent. I try to carry that spirit into the classroom with me every day. So uh, at my core, I'm a hip hop head, I'm a lover of literature, um, and I'm a denizen of, of NYC. So New York stand up, always. Ezekiel, when did you fall in love with music? Um, I think I fell in love with music at a young age. I used to always, my granddad um, from Macon, Georgia, he used to be the one that, I think everyone has that person that kind of helped expose them to the world at a young age. My granddad used to come and we used to drive uh, through the Gulf to visit family in his, in his green Cadillac. And he used to play everything from Curtis to Gladys Knight to the four tops to the spinners. And I think just seeing, you know, how much kind of like those memories brought him back to certain specifics in his life and, and just and just being in the, in the army, being in Vietnam, just seeing how much that music spoke to him and his generation, it, it kind of fostered my love of, of what music can do, of how music can speak to people in a deeper level and how music can also be a real, uh, a real, I guess, signifier of, of certain moments in people's lives. Um, that's who I, I attribute my my music taste to and and just my my passion for it, my passion for it, my passion for music, my passion for travel, my passion from learning from different people's perspectives and, and traveling. That is where I, I attribute my love for it from. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Tanya, how old were you and when, when did you fall in love with music? Um, look I'm going to I assume that you fell in love with me. That was a leading question. <laughs> so yeah, I, I fell in love with music. I can say like a solid age of four years old, but if I could say before the womb, probably during that time, I was um, raised by a very young a teenage mother who was very caught up in the times in the middle of the 70s during an amazing boon of soul music and just all kinds of wonderful music. And she was a teenager that absorbed all of that music. So of course, whatever she listened to at the age of 16, I also listened to. So I've, I got fed a healthy diet of Stevie Wonder, of Earth, Wind and Fire, of Shaka Khan and Rufus, of Aretha, of so many people. And not just that, just Memphis soul music like Betty Wright and, you know, and, and Shirley Brown and Isaac Hayes and all of these different people that were, you know, active during the 70s and being that and then being raised in the church um, and learning how to sing at the age of four, standing on a chair and, you know, putting the microphone down to where it can reach me. Uh -huh. All of those influences really shaped me. And I just absolutely fell in love and knew that this is what I wanted to do for a living in whatever capacity. Understood. Understood. Chris? When did you, when did, did you fall in love with music? How old were you? When did you fall in love with music? Um, man, uh, very, very early age. Uh, I knew as soon as I saw Criss Cross jump on the screen with their pants on backwards, you know what I'm saying? I, I knew I wanted to be a part of that, that culture, that, that energy or that vibe that, um, that was that displayed across the screen or, or I used to watch the box. I don't know if y'all remember, y'all had the, um, yeah before cable, the, the little channel that you call in and request the videos. Um, so I would say, man, six, seven. Um, but, you know, my household was is pretty dynamic because my mother's originally from Puerto Rico. She's a senator from, from Puerto Rico. And my father's from Memphis. So it's kind of, I had the the, um, the soul and kind of like the, the Spanish roots or the Spanish culture of music. And all of it was beautiful and like for it to come together. Um, it was, I was very versatile, put it that way. <laughs> understood, understood. Uh, and DMX was your favorite rapper, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. DMX is my favorite rapper. Um, for, for uh, it, it was just a, a journey. Why? I'm back it. Tell us why. <laughs> why is DMX your favorite rapper? Yeah. DMX was my favorite rapper because our, our lifestyles are very, very similar. Um, you know, he was, left at a, he was left at a young age to defend for himself. Um, and so to navigate the world, this big world alone. And, you know, um, it was, he was very relatable. Like I didn't relate to the shiny suits and all of that. I related to pain, uh, torture, abandonment, um, not having a voice, you know, all of those things that I related to homelessness. Uh, I, I, I literally is homeless from some eighth grade to my 12th grade year of college, uh, high school. 
um, my first apartment. I remember my first year of college. I slept on the floor my freshman year uh, of college until I got a job, got scholarships, and did all of that to to be able to, to um, create the life that I wanted, for lack of a better term. So. Yeah. That's why um, D- DMX kind of like was that 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 uh, that guiding light, you know. What 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 lyric in particular? <laughs> what lyric? Um, I know. Oh my god! Uh, you know what? It, it, it's it's dark and hell is hot. I think I don't think it was necessarily a, 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 a lyric. I think it was the fact that you know um, that uh, the title of that album was a cry it was a was a statement but the entire album was a journey that he was on and he was crying for help the entire time and all he wanted was was to um if you with me then you with me if you're not you know what i'm saying like uh, i can't remember the exact line but when i remember it I, i'll bring it up i'll, I'll yeah. definitely um understood i definitely definitely recite it understood understood uh uh uh, uh from asked you a different question uh uh, uh, when did you know that words were things? I've always known that. I mean, in part because the connection between words and music and spirit were always so explicit in my upbringing. So I was preparing myself to answer a question about music. Uh, and for me, it's always just had a kind of cosmic power, right? That in church growing up, you would play music to bring the spirit, right? The spirit wouldn't fall necessarily if the music wasn't right, um, if the preaching wasn't powerful. So for me, I always knew language had the power to shape the world. When my mother heard a sermon she loved, she would say, that's my word for the week. And it would be a kind of armor she carried with her. So I knew I wanted to be a poet from when I was about four years old, because I wanted that type of uh, power, but also the ability to bring beauty uh, into ugly and difficult situations. You look at rappers as Poet. Come on now, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, and yeah, Max's name. I mean, that that's exciting because that brings me that brings me to the place I need to be. I mean, the biggest class I teach at Dartmouth is a lecture course of over fifty students on Black music and Black poetry, and we always begin with hip hop. One, because it's the most popular poetry in the history of the world, but two, it's the lingua franca. You know, of my students. That's the language we all speak, and many of them think they hate poetry but love hip hop, not realizing that poetry is the basis of all the lyrics that they love, right? So yeah, I mean, hip hop, that's that's the magnetism. That's what brings them to the seats. And it's an honor to be a part of that tradition. Understood, understood. So Farlu, you have a uh, a, a different orientation to music. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm interested. And so I almost feel like the question of when did you fall in love with music is a strange one because music was, uh, uh, it existed in a different way, independent of whether or not you liked it or not. I'm interested in, um, in, in, in uh, not only your journey, if you fell in love with music and, and if you could really unpack what music, how music was positioned in your life and, your, and the responsibility related there too, from a young age. Yeah, very, thank you for asking me that. Uh, I, I'm an Indian. I grew up in India and was raised there in Mumbai, a city. And my mother is a musician. So she, in my house, it was always music. And she spotted that I could sing the first note, do, do, in pitch at two and a half years old, when I was two and a half. So she started training me. And at three, she formally enrolled me to my teacher's class. In India, we don't have universities of this magnitude we go to our teachers classes and their homes to study music one-on-one with your teacher and this music is not written it's orally transitioned from one generation to the other i being the 11th generation of carrying on this traditional music i had to literally study from four o'clock in the morning to 11 at night as a young, young child. And our training was very, very rigorous. It was not, I played a little bit, but more it was always a focus and the diligence of practice and really making sure that you worship music, you surrender to music, and it becomes your life is what we are taught. 
that music is not just a tool of an ent entertainment it is a tool to go to have your journey your life journey and then get to the almighty so it's a the journey is the most interesting uh channel for us rather than the destination and the way i fell in music is at six years old i met with a bike accident and i was admitted in the hospital and the pain was so excruciating in that hospital that i wasn't able to cope up i was six years old my mother said start singing and i'm like start singing she goes yeah start singing so at the time of physical pain music became my medicine i started singing and i never stopped because that was the only bliss i could see when i was dying with pain and that was a turning point of my life where i decided that only thing i want to do ever is sing and that was my journey it is still my journey i am still looking for that first note that i need to hit with proper intensity and with it's perfection so it is a journey to strive for perfection as a human being as a musician yeah yeah thank you for sharing that um i guess i'll, I'll answer the question too and I'll, I'll just give a quick story uh uh for my master's program i went to the cincinnati conservatory and i was studying with a uh, a renowned horn professor randy gardner if you're watching this i love you you are the best movie ever um and uh, I was I think I was in one of my earliest lessons, and he asked me a question, and it, and and I don't think he understood that it changed everything. Um, he asked, "Okay, so like, what music do you like?" And I'm a classical French horner, so I was like, "Oh, you know, like rap and R and B, a little bit of like pop." I'm like going through the list of all the type of music that I like, and he says very frankly, uh, "I noticed that you didn't say classical music," and I thought to myself. And that was the first time that I ever had a consciousness that people were playing music because they liked classical music. That was not the reason why I was playing music. I was playing music because it was something that was able to propel me to a different life. I wasn't playing it because I liked it. <laughs> I mean, I happened to like certain pieces. I happened to like certain aspects of things, but that wasn't my reason why I was playing it. I fell in love with music in the fifth grade I was in the, the auditorium of my elementary school, Annie H. Knight from Chestnut Street in Wilmington, North Carolina. And the high school uh, uh, orchestra was doing the tour and they stopped by and played a concert in fifth grade. And I remember one of my friends was on stage and he had a bass, he was playing a bass. It was a, friend, it was a neighborhood kid who just so happened to be in high school at the time. And I remember thinking to myself, that is the coolest thing in life. Like I remember being like, I'm gonna do that when I'm in sixth grade. I'm playing whatever that is. Um, and I got to got to the sixth grade, um, and and uh, I, I my teacher asked me, well, well what do you want to play? And I was just like, the trumpet. <laughs> um, and she was like, okay, great. And I remember when I got the instrument, I opened it up, and I was mortified because I thought the saxophone name was a trumpet. <laughs> so I remember opening my case and thinking I was gonna have a saxophone and being like, what is this? <laughs> um, and I was like, it only has three buttons. Um, anyway, that's anyway, that's my sister. So uh, long story short, uh, that was my journey. Uh, by accidentally thinking that the saxophone was a trumpet, uh, I learned that instrument and then switched to the French horn, and the French horn was the one that would propel me through through life. So um, that's a that's a, a quick story about how I fell in love with music. Um, okay, so uh, at this point, you know, we all are coming to this conversation in in a, in a different way. We all represent different backgrounds, experiences, whatever. Um, but now I want to talk about how you use the music as a tool to navigate the good, the bad, and the ugly for yourself or how you've seen it in others. You don't have to tell your personal story if you don't want to. You don't feel compelled to have to say anything. But I'm, I'm interested for anybody who wants to answer for your art, for music, or whatever else, how do you use it uh, to navigate the world? Anybody can, can speak up. 
I'll jump in. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think I, I shared this story with you earlier as far as when I was young and how I use music as a um, as an escape tool. A lot of times, you know, of course, you're putting in um, positions and situations as a child that you cannot get away from um, because you are a child. And music literally saved my life in that sense to where I can go inside of my head and I can sing those songs that made me happy. I can remember those lyrics that 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 always made me smile and, and would always put me in a better place than where I was, even with my physical couldn't be there mentally, you know, humming this song inside of my head um, would put me in that in that different space in that safer space. And even as you know, as a child, I began to make up lyrics, make up situations, make up scenarios. And all of that actually helped me um, become as, as an adult, be a singer songwriter, you know, and, and help to to write those lyrics and formulate those lyrics because I could experience others people um, other people's emotions, their situations, um, different things through music and can put their emotions to words in that sense. And music really helped me in that. And even today in teaching and relating to a lot of um, the youth that I mentor and the, um, the young people that I work with, um, teaching them to do the same, to take themselves out of the situation and to take that anger and to, you know, to let that anger flow out of them like a pen, you know, with the ink and let that hurt and that pain and even that happiness and just all of those emotions that um, that they get, you know, gain through life, knowing how to release that and let it come out in the form of, you know, in a form of freedom, you know, through that ink or through that pencil that, you know, on the paper and just getting those words out and expressing themselves in that in that sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I hear, what I heard in a deeper sense was this notion of, of being a channel. Yes. Right. Not letting it stay in here and fester, but letting it pass through you in a particular way. And so have that experience of, of, of music and an experience of music being something that allowed you to channel something into being. Um, yes, um, of course. And of course, uh, you know, of course, we talked about this. I always look at singing as being a direct connection to the divine or a direct connection to God. Um, in that sense of again allowing that to channel, I feel like you know during singing or listening to listening to certain lyrics or even writing certain lyrics, it opens up this pathway um, from connected, you know, to spirituality, and it just channels through me. And in a sense, it's a washing. It washes everything, and it washes those things out of you, whether good or bad, and it puts them, you know, out into the world because negative, positive, all of those things could be an influence to someone else who needs that same type of release. So again, you know, your light, it's the whole theory of your light, you know, lighting the way for someone else in a sense. And so it just, again, channeling it and, and moving it. Yeah, yeah. What about anybody else? Talk, respond or talk about that? Yeah, I can speak a little bit. Um, so when COVID happened in April, May, uh, our world shut down. And I remember when I was a kid in Mumbai in 93, there were riots. The religious riots had broken and we were learning music and we were speci specifically learning these five songs that my teacher was teaching. And every time we could, we would hear a scream or somebody would be set on fire. I went to my room as a little child and I, I sang this song. And these five songs always gave me peace and hope to get out of that situation. It was bad. It was ugly. I n never want to be in that situation ever. But those five songs came to my rescue again this year in April and May when we were listening to the television seeing so many lives were lost because of COVID. I decided to remotely record an album with my band Karishma and we picked those five songs and recorded an album called Someday and it's just released and I feel like the solace, the peace, the hope that those five songs gave me as a child would translate through this album and i'm hoping that anybody who listens to someday will get the same peace and hope and freedom from what i have from what i felt when i was singing them so it was my escape out of the bad situation the bad riots the ugly human beings killing each other attitude and the darkness but it lifted me and that's what I feel music can lift you and put you in a different place of goodness, 
helpfulness, hope, and peace. It has that power, and that power is spiritual. And we should just try to en en enforce it as much as we can. Yeah, I think on that note too, the music can just give you confidence for all kinds of social situations. So I think too, growing up, it helped me make friends. I was always a shy bookish kid that kept to himself, but I would create these freestyle stories with my big sister, where she'd give me a word or a phrase and freestyle rap became a way actually for me to create a social life uh, in middle school forward. Uh, even now, before I give a lecture or go into an auditorium to deliver new work, I'll put on my dip set playlist and I get charged up to go do the work ahead of me. And so I think there's something to be said too for the way music becomes a bomb for the most difficult moments of our lives. Um, the way we remember moments of great intimacy, of love, of despair, of change, I think are often marked by a soundtrack. And so even as a writer, I'm always aspiring toward the kind of beauty uh, that music made available to me whenever I turn to the page. My favorite living writer, Sylvia Winter says, she wants her writing uh, to look the way Aretha Franklin sounds when she sings. And I think I'm after something similar, you know? For myself personally, music was the first airplane, the first Instagram, the first mode of travel, if you will. Um, I think growing up, especially growing up, music was still very regional. So I would hear things and my mind would, <clears throat> my mind would immediately go to, where does the sound come from? Like, where does the spirit of the sound come from? Where does the tradition of the sound come from? Um, so music was always that kind of thing in the back of my head, especially being born, like where I was, where I'm from from, it's super rural, dirt roads, double wide trailers, single wide trailers, maybe population of like 2000 people. Um, so for me, it's like music was that first opening to understanding how big the world was outside of the surroundings that I was growing up in every day. Um, and it, that's what gave me, I guess, that inspiration at a young age to want to see, want to seek out, want to meet and, and, and discover um, how big the world was, how interesting people are, how beautiful the communities we live in are. Um, that it was a sense of pride. Um, so that's what music has always been for me. It's been that kind of getaway. Uh, into into seeing and, and hearing a world that I can envision. It, it, it helped my imagination. It continues to help my imagination. Um, jump in and I, I, I'm actually telling everybody. I think for me, uh, similar, it became, uh, in my situation, it became a an escape, a way to escape the madness that was going on around me uh, while also providing hope for the future and giving me the confidence that I could change the future and manifest it in a way that I want or what I saw success to be or what I didn't want in my life or uh, what I wanted to stay away from and envision like a peaceful life. So it's it, like, like Falu, I think spoke to this earlier, it's like music was the medicine, but it also can help you escape whatever harsh reality that you're in and allow you to dream. For sure. Um, sorry, I'm eating m and <laughs> You caught me in the middle of the tour. Um, <laughs> I, I will say um, uh, that's been my experience, too. Um, uh, I had a challenging home life. Um, and uh, music, it was an escape. But I don't, I don't want to say it is an escape. I perceived it as an escape when I was young. But really, it was a coming home. Um, it was a, it was the place in my life that actually felt true. Um, when I had an instrument in my hand, when I was playing music, when there was a song in my heart, or, or whatever else, like that was actually when I when I was and still am to this day at most peace, um, at peace mode or whatever. Uh, I'm saying this because um, I think that there's an interesting thing as we evolve as adults and whoever else where. We are, we're, we're perceiving the experiences that we have in relation to music uh, kind of apart from ourselves. Um, and one of the things I posit is that it's the opposite, that really it's the coming home to ourselves. Um, and it's the thing that resonates and that's true. And the reason why music is that thing that like vibrates in a particular way in your spirit and your soul is because it is at the same vibrational level as your spirit and your soul. 
It is your spirit here, so be made manifest in the world. For someone, someone somewhere had a interaction with the divine or an interaction with what they call God or interaction with whatever it is that they interacted with, and they made this thing in the world, right? And accordingly, that thing that they made resonates across whole populations, a whole individual, whole worlds. And I honestly think it's because it's the interaction with the divine, not only outside of us, but also in us. And that, that's, uh, anyway, I can get, I can go off on a tangent, but I just want to, you know, put out there that I think that something about uh, uh, the notion of, of music being recorded at this point with the understanding that, you know, music has been passed down orally pretty much in every, you know, indigenous tradition and whatever else, that what you're experiencing is a, an interaction with someone's God. <sighs> okay, so um, at this point, you know, we we talked a little bit about our own situation. You know, we've talked a little bit about how you know music has been used to sort us uh, to uh, to to support us and or uh, a conduit through which we've navigated the world to a certain extent. And for many of us, it's been because it was it's been a trauma response. Um, but I think that there's also a shift where you're doing something because of trauma and then you're doing something consciously. Meaning I, uh, I have this narrative, it was like for so long in my life, I was running away from home, right? And then all of a sudden I realized I was running towards my dreams, right? And I use music as the thing that will help me get to where I was trying to go manifest and whatever else. Uh, at this state in your life, where are you running towards? I think for myself, I've um, I recognize the power in my music and my voice and uh, in my story, and that I could actually share it and help help others uh, overcome whatever they're going through or similar situations or kind of channel and acknowledge what's going on around them, um, and to understand what they need to do to to, to ex not escape it but um, to create that 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 next that better life that they want. I think mine has happened by accident. I had the um, opportunity to merge my passion and my love, which is helping people, helping my community. Um, and my love is music together. Uh, when I had an opportunity to do that, it opened my eyes to um, so many possibilities of art. As a teaching artist or songwriter, producer, um, you know, screenwriter, whatever the case may be. And I think that is how music has, has changed my life um, currently. Um, for me, um, my son has just turned nine months about a week ago. So for me, I think I'm running towards legacy. Um, legacy, not only obviously in, in terms of creating something a value within the music industry, but also legacy in terms of changing the music industry for what I perceive to be the better. I know a lot of people have seen Kanye's recent rants about, you know, just the overall, I guess, uh, overall, I guess, not necessarily evilness, but a lot of the trickery that goes along in music contracts and music industry period. So for me, like my legacy, I would like it to hinge on actually changing that, actually transparency, music education, but furthermore, uh, creating open pathways into it. Um, I know a lot of young kids are fans of music and that when they when they envision working in music, they envision themselves as the artist. But for me, I want them to see the full scope of what it means to work within music, whether it's education, whether it's in management, whether it's in production, whether it's in touring and, and see that no matter what you're interested in, it could be sports, entertainment, politics, that there are a myriad of ways to work in something that you love and still have a close proximity and a close passion to it. So I think for me, I'm, I'm really working on building that type of legacy and building that type of infrastructure for my son, his son, his son, his daughter, you know, just family period, you know, so that's what I'm working towards. Beautiful. I want to I want to follow up on that because a lot of music educators 
um, one of the, the tragedies of music education is that it's so focused on Western classical music that it doesn't actually even acknowledge the music industry as a whole as even being the thing. <sighs> and I can spend an hour just on that. Yeah, like, easily. It's it's, it's 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 important. I mean, especially now, like for me, yeah. it's like when I think about the music industry, it's global. It's a global industry. It it is it is a universal language and it is a universal connector amongst all people around the world. And I think it's important that when we talk about the music industry, we talk about it in a global sense. And I think when you talk about it in a global sense, that allows room for perspectives, for teaching about history, we're teaching about culture. Um, you know, growing up, I, I feel like my music education wasn't that exciting per se. You know, I remember having a recorder and learning how to read notes and things that, but it wasn't dynamic. Um, you know, when I talked to a lot of other people that, you know, had different type of education when it comes to music, they, they speak about dynamic situations, dynamic experiences. And um, for me, that's like, oh, that's amazing. It's, I wish I would have had that type of exposure. But I think if it's not going to happen in the classroom, there's a lot of ways it can happen outside of the classroom. And I think that's some of the things I'm trying to work on is figuring out programs that allow for that education and music business to be dynamic, be fun. Um, because it's interesting, you know, and it's always changing. No one knows everything. I don't care how many years you're in the industry or how much money you've made. It's constantly changing. And because it's constantly changing, I think we need to constantly change how we how we teach people um, that are interested in being uh, in, in and around it. Yeah, yeah. And this notion of the music industry, you know, again, for music educators, it's an empty word. It, it We understand that, you know, uh, 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 songs are created and that, you know, videos are made and whatever else. But in its simplest form, might you describe what the music industry actually is to a person mm -hmm. who really doesn't know in any way, shape, or form? Yeah. I, th I think that the it's 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 sad because the current system, the current education system, is not um, designed to allow students to think for themselves. They are specifically designed to put them in two boxes. You're in the university path or you're on a technical path. And if you're not on either one of these paths, then you're on the wrong path or something's wrong with you. So I think we have to change um, the way the system, the entire, the entire system and allow for students to explore different, um, different industries. And, and what music is so, um, so infinite like like if just because you're learning in a, in a music class you can learn to be a producer an engineer a songwriter a screenwriter um and you can do so many different things um within the industry and i think that we do need to although i do uh we do need to increase the after school programs um and all of those things it can't it, can't, it needs to be learned outside of the classroom but we have to make some initiative or take some initiative to kind of incorporate or make the connection to um, inside if we want to be relevant education. Understood. Follow me. Oh, gosh, you're like, you're about to say something. Well, yeah, I mean, because just following up on Chris's point, I think there's a larger philosophical question we have to answer, right? Is music education an end unto itself, right? Is it good all on its own? Is it supposed to prepare us to do other things or enter other industries? And I think music for me taught me how to feel. It's part of the reason I teach literature. I think literature helps teach us how to think and how to feel and to go into any field of inquiry we run. And I'm just curious for all of us here that are educators, people that work in the industry, how have you come to reconcile that for yourself? Do, do you teach music um, as something that's an end unto itself or is music part of a just larger toolkit you're trying to give students uh, to navigate the world? I wanna answer that one. Um, uh, in a, in a, let me just let me just put this out here, right? Um, I have been a teacher in challenging classroom environment. Tresman High School is one of them in Memphis, of Tennessee. Uh, Yo Gotti's, it was Yo Gotti School, right? Um, I I have been an administrator. I have been a, in black led organizations. I have been in white led organizations, philosophically and otherwise. I have been a funder, helping and supporting black led organizations and white led organizations. And I've worked in these large scale institutions that operate in a very particular way. And what music 
uh, to answer your question about it is, is it is it is it is it the end or you know does it continue on in a particular way i realized very quickly that the way in which the power structure uh, understood music for themselves was the way was the extent to which i would be able to express in that environment um and if i went one step further the extent to which it's interesting. I, I think that this could be accurate. The extent to which someone sees the utility of music in the world is not actually the extent to which they see uh, infinite possibilities within themselves or finite possibilities within themselves, right? So I find that uh, because I was a musician who was told that I can do anything I want to do as long as I was willing to sit down in that chair and, and, and figure it out, um, because that was my experience, there, there's, there's not a barrier that I see. I do not actually see barriers. I see a workaround. I see a possibility. I see a way to manifest it. I don't actually see barriers. If you're like, we want to go to the moon, I'm like, great, let's figure it out. Like, that's just the way that my brain works because that's how you have to exist in order to play a French horn, to play that high C at pianissimo. You're going to have to do a whole lot, you know, of practicing in order to, to make that thing just pop out like that. It don't just happen, right? Um, I'm, I'm saying this because, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I had to, as a human being, as someone who does exist without possibilities, uh, it, it hurts in a particular way to work within environments, societies, etc., that that limit themselves, not knowing that anything is possible, or at least you can try. Like, come on, like you could at least try to do something. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's what happens. And, and so if you're coming into it saying, you know, well, well, the only music that's possible is just things that I learned when I played a violin or Western classical music or whatever. If you're going in with that mindset, then you have just limited yourself to a very specific time in history and only one dot on the earth in a very specific time in history. It's just like there was a whole world of people who had music and you decided just to stick on one part of it. But that's the exact same, in my opinion, in relation to uh, 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 of how people exist in their lives, uh, in relation to music and otherwise, where it's just like, hey, y'all, like, you know, you could do anything, especially mm -hmm. if you're in the global north, particularly the United States, and you have access to a tremendous amount of resources and opportunities, regardless of what your positionality or situation is, you can basically with the social structures in place do pretty much anything even though it's going to be difficult over time it's like if that's an understanding the question then becomes why did you choose to limit yourself <laughs> and, and it, i think i think we think about it and um it, it, oh my it's, it's crazy it's almost like you have all of these kids within a school environment or a school system right you have a basketball team which has a cap of 15 to 20 kids that could be on a basketball team you have a football team that has about 100 kids, 75 to 100 kids that can be on a basketball team. You have a band, you have choir, right? But all of the rest of the kids is like, oh, just I don't know what they, they don't want to do nothing with their life. Just leave them over here in the corner. With music, you know, it's infinite. They, you, anybody, you can be songwriters. You can have, you, you can create the infrastructure um, that you want to be so inclusive to everyone. Because what you're gonna do is people that play football are gonna want to learn how to be an engineer or make beats or be creative. It, it, there's everybody's creative, and I think the the disappointing part is, is in Memphis a couple of years ago, they posted a picture of like Yo Gotti and all of these people who are in the industry from Memphis, throughout the city, and I looked at that billboard and I was like, wow, that's powerful. They made it. However, you didn't help them get there. In their entire school, in their entire life, you didn't even give them the platform, the voice. I don't think your guy even graduated high school. Did so not. You can't take credit for that. You cannot take credit for all of his hard work. That's not going to, I'm not, no, it's not going to happen. That's whack. And I think that we, again, we still take that mentality of like, we're not even going to try to invest in something new. We're not even going to even try to build or develop a program that could be inclusive and that could also be revenue generating. Um, and, and actually, like, like, think about this, for example. People travel from around the world to come to Memphis and record. And when they leave and take the sound, they become successful. Little John. Uh, uh, Cardi uh, B. Huh? Cardi. 
Cardi B, all everybody. And it's it's like like wow, y'all. And, and the problem with Memphis in, in particular is they care about legacy. Um, you know, saying the BB Kings, the Elvises, rather than cultivating the talent that they have here already. Put things in perspective, and I'm done. Last year, we had about four or five artists on the Billboard chart. Five. There's no infrastructure for music or hip hop music in Memphis at all. So imagine if we had that infrastructure, like in Atlanta, like a Cali, like in New York. How many more artists will be on the billboards? How many millionaires we've we created? I'm, I'm, rest, I'm done after that. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be quiet. Yeah, yeah I mean, in, in, I want to I want to respond to that one because in particular places like a Memphis, basically, someone once told me that culture is actually a, a, a response to oppression. It's the world you created because you couldn't actually live your full of life in a particular way. And it just so happened that Memphis is like one of those places that had a whole lot of oppression. And it just so happens that w one of the challenges of being somebody who worked in Memphis is that you're like, holy shit, there is, there is the highest population of brilliant human beings densely populated that I've ever seen in my whole entire life and most of them don't actually know it because the environment doesn't confirm that in any way because there are no ladders for their dreams in a particular way. So in order for you to 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 express your brilliance in a particular way, you got to do football, you got to do basketball, you got to you could be a rapper, uh, you could be a drug dealer, you could be very specific things because those are areas where you can fund yourself through it. Right? So, yeah. Get it. I respect that the people who are doing what they got to do to be able to fund their pathway into the industry, whatever else, more power to you. I hope you bring all that money back to your community with the understanding that you wouldn't have had to do that if your environment actually supported you doing what you uh, wanted to do and express in the world. But that's my thought about getting right. that. And I want to jump in um, with that because, you know, of course, I work in legacy. And, you know, Ben, um, Chris, you mentioned that the focus a lot of times on legacy um, and not the, the, I guess, the newness. And so I kind of work in the cross sections of both of those. And even when you look at the legacy, the very important tale of the, the lesson in teaching about these legacy artists, because a lot of these artists that you see being boasted and prideful from these different cities have died with no money. Their, fam their family don't have possession of their the publishing rights. Some of them have died with no tombstones on their grave, no identifier to show that they were here in this world outside of their music that is left here that someone else is profiting on. So it's even that, you know, teaching the kids those aspects, because again, they see this legacy talk and they look at like, oh, well, B.B. King, Bob blue bland you know this type of thing and they hear them in these you know hear them in you know behind jay-z you had little beaver you hear party life and you hear all these samples not even knowing little beaver to this day is driving a airport shuttle outside of miami from miami dade county and probably doesn't even know the music that was sampled by him because he does not own it and that's the thing that's the thing. That's the part of the legacy that we miss a lot of times in teaching because we teach about this greatness and we show, yeah, they made it. We, they made it. But just like a lot of those kids, what you all just mentioned, they made it without the support. And even so, they made it without education. Some of these artists, six, seven, if they got to that point, the levels of education, um, not being able to read, um, being a completely illiterate, but being able to pin and articulate some of the most beautiful aspects of this world with no genius whatsoever and that's the part that we miss we talk about the success but we don't really all, we don't talk about the lack of support the fact yeah. people use that lack of support as a bridge and they made it anyway despite anyway bridge, anyway and that's that's the part we should be teaching that's the lesson in that in everything and that's what we, we really should relate to the youth that yeah. despite of in spite of anyway anyhow in whatever words you want to use people you live ready I gotta, put the, I gotta put the i gotta put the fire emojis in that chat box right there right yeah period because that's the thing no one wants to talk about like i said we lift people up but we don't we don't talk about the parts where they were trampled down by those yeah. same people that lift them up, yeah. by the same people that profit, yeah. by the same people that, you know, to this day make money while their kids, the, the kids of these artists, these legacy artists are sitting here starving and going without. 
we don't talk about that and the prosperity yeah, and the yeah. wealth, the transfer of wealth yeah. that music created. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, I, we got to talk about that. I mean, this panel is music for liberation and I feel like you just made the case for it just now. <laughs> but, but, but it's true because the process of, if you have a different way of being in the world, if, if the musician's way of being is not the dominant way of being, it means that it constantly presses against the dominant design in a particular way, which means the notion of you, if, I have the greatest respect for musicians because if you became a musician, you had to actually manifest out of a whole bunch of shit of people telling you you should not become a rapper. You should not become a musician. You should not do that. How are you possibly going to sustain your life? How are you possibly going to sustain yourself? And the whole time you got to say, I got to believe in myself. I got to believe in myself. And the reason why is because there are so many music educators. There are so many individuals. There are so many people who don't actually allow musical futures to exist in the same way uh, unless you play a violin. You know, unless you play a classical instrument, those are the only features that are completely possible. So we're trying to make space in this way for the fact that because the world is so uh, myopic, I guess, in this viewpoint, it's so specific in what possibilities and futures are possible. It means that the people who have always been there manifesting realities because they had to have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. We got to do it with some help. What does it mean? It means that they're really good at what they do. It means that they're really good at finding workarounds. But I guarantee you, personally, it's like, I wish I didn't have to do that. <laughs> Facts. You know, I didn't want to. You know, my I, own, so. I didn't want to have to start organization here in order to do this and do this thing and build. This. I didn't want to have to do those things. But there was no other articulated pathway in this environment specifically for a black man. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. In my experience in the South, in a particular way, in arts administration, now working in all of these certain organizations, and I'm the only chocolate chip in the cookie. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's the reason yeah. because it's hard because folks don't open the door for you. You got to come in with a sledgehammer. You got to knock it down, period. You got to shake the room up. You got to do something. And you gotta shake the room up. Shake that room up long enough, they're going to shake your ass out. That room. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I think the piece that I would love for, like, music educators to take away is that we have to create an environment and creating a culture and to, that empowers students that um that cre you know created an environment where students want to learn rather than telling them they have to learn you know personalize their learning experience tap into their interest um less of giving choices more of inspiring possibilities kind of idea um you know it's just helping us helping mm -hmm. the students uh, figure out what they want to do and learn from their process um, by using, you know, like taking the resources that they have and applying that. Um, and, and maybe they, they fail along the way, but eventually they're going to come to the end. They're going to get to the end and find their formula or their success or their tools or their uh, strategy that works for them. And that's like empowering them and teaching them confidence, ability, uh, adaptability and all of those different things. Those are the skill sets that they're going to learn and take off into the world and solve problems. I, since we're talking about so much liberation, um, I remember my teacher's teacher who taught me this one sentence. And that one sentence opened up a horizon for me to come to America to meet fantastic people like you guys, to meet, to make this country my own country. Is I'll sing, say it in Hindi first and then I'll say it in English. Gana wo hai jo ruh gaye aur ruh sune. Music is such that a soul sings and a soul hears. There is nothing uh, beyond and above. Follow, beautiful. Say that, say that one more time. Can you say that one more time? Music is such that a soul sings and a soul hears. Drop the mic. <laughs> like, 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 oh my gosh. We're not separate. We are one. We are, oh my God. I would, we, I would, are. we gotta, can you write that in the chat box? I wanna hear it in Andy too. Like, seriously. Hindi. I need both. Yes. Gana wo hai jo ruh gai aur ruh sune. Music is such that a soul sings and a soul hears. God. Yes. 
Yes. That deserves the DJ horn. Pew, 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 pew. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Matt, Matt, you're talking right now, but you're, you're mute. You're muted. Bro, 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 I'm the rookie here. I'm the one who's supposed to be running the show, and I'm the rookie with the muted mic. I'm sorry. I was just so inspired. It was like Tanya, boom. Then it was like Falu, boom. It was like right at the end. You yeah. saved all of the fire. It was all fire all the way through, but that fire at the end, oh, yeah. wow. Matt, was... before, but you're here too, right? Um, and I know you're DJing and like whatever else, but you had an experience here today. Um, and I'm interested in knowing what you heard and what you felt and if you might be able to reflect and resonate to us uh, uh, that a little bit of that. So, yeah, yeah. You know, just taking all of this in, I think that you picked the perfect topic for this, that idea of music for liberation. You know, um, it's it's a way I mean, hearing Chris talking about using music as an escape. What did she uh -oh. turn to? She turned to music, you know, uh, hearing Duran talking about how he came out of all of the, you know, all of the difficulties and all of the things that were going on in his life and what brought him out of it, his French horn, you know, like that idea that it is a path forward, but it's an imperfect path. I think that's one of the things that, that struck me, you know, um, hearing Chris talking about how the infrastructure just isn't there, you know, it's like, and I, that blew me away, Chris, when you were like five musicians on, on the billboard list. And it's like, what if the infrastructure was there? What if the path was there? Like, you know, there, there's still so much work to be done, I think is one of the things that I, I realized, but the fact that people are using this and it, music, I mean, music educators, like the ones that are watching this right now are able to use, um, use this to, to help students make the, the life. I think Duran, you said it best. It was like to, to make the life that they envision, you know, the skill sets and the competencies and all of those things that you can take to go where you want to go, that there is a path forward. It's just, I'm, I just feel very fortunate to get to have been a fly on the wall in this conversation. This was, this was, this was amazing. So, all right. Thank you. Yeah, we're happy you allowed us to be here, and I got to give you a shout out too. This format, this this format that we're in right now, is a format that Matt literally created as a as an educator, as a teacher. He saw a different way of being and a different possibility for the way that kids and young people would learn, and he just did it. And it, he's following up in a particular way, and like us having this conversation in this way on this platform is because one day. In your life, you said there has to be a different way, and you did it. So I just want to, you know, give you some, give you some uh, props for, for actually doing that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I so appreciate that. Yeah, you, no, and I, I appreciate all of you. You all have brought, I mean, you've you've brought the house down. This has been fantastic. So, um, if you're watching this video and you're still with us, which I'm imagining that you probably are still with us. If you want to get caught up with any of the folks that are here on the speaker page, we're going to have all of their, you know, links and all their social media and everything so that you can follow up with them more. So um, for everybody that's been watching here, I just want to say to you six again, thank you for sharing your life, sharing your heart, sharing the fire, you know, and bringing it to us to inspire us because I think that's what so many educators need. So again, thank you so much. Thank you for having thank us. You guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. everyone. It's been a blessing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone. And one more time, thank you so much for those of you that are watching. Thank you so much for joining the Soundtrap Education Summit. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Bye.